Welcome everyone. Um, hard to believe, but we're having a face-to-face -face seminar at TRI. Um, good to see so many people in the audience and thank you for those joining online. Um, uh, just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, uh, the Turrbal and Yagara peoples on the lands that we meet today and pay our respects to their elders past and present. This is the first Game Changer seminar for 2022. And the focus of the series this year is looking forward to 2032. Um, our first speaker or our speaker today is Professor Margaret Scheel, AO, Vice Chancellor and President of the Queensland University of Technology. She commenced her tenure in uh, February of 2018, having previously been the provost at the University of Melbourne from 2012 to 2017, and before that, the CEO of the Australian Research Council. She's been an academic in chemistry with um, undergraduate degree in science and PhD in physical chemistry at the University of New South Wales. And her early career, both as an academic and then as an academic leader, was at the University of Wollongong, where she was Dean of Science and Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research. She's a fellow of two of the Australian Academies, the Australian Academy of Science and the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering. Um, she was made an Officer of the Order of Australia for distinguished service to science and higher education. And we're really pleased to have her speak to us today. She's going to present on the topic, the challenges emerging from the pandemic and opportunities for academic research with a focus on alternative research uh, sources funding, amongst other things. Welcome, Margaret. Um, thank you very much. And um, sometimes one writes a title and then thinks, uh, did I really agree to talk about that? But I, I will touch on some of that. And uh, it's a wonderful uh, to be here. And thank you, Scott, for the... Uh, invitation and um, I too acknowledge the Turrbal and the Agra people uh, as uh, the owners of the land uh, where QUT and TRI stands and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and also acknowledge the chair of TRI, David Siddle, who um, has been incredibly supportive since I returned to Queensland and in fact has been incredibly supportive for my entire career when I, from, dating from when I was a young uh, and very inexperienced DVC research at the University of Wollongong. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about challenges of the pandemic and, and, and what's emerged from that, how we've responded, what the new government uh, may do, um, and how that's impacted uh, collectively all those things on individuals. And then in talking about how we're positioning QUT to 2027, really we're looking to 2032 and the opportunities that that provides. And so um, I'll touch briefly on, on how we've positioned ourselves and uh, how we're looking to um, uh, look at those for some of those alternate funding sources and opportunities. So, um, and when I spoke here at the uh, CAUSE uh, symposium or, or uh, uh, conference, I talked about university business models and the, for most of my career, uh, university business models have been driven by this paradigm of um, international students um, have been uh, driven investments in research because that in turn has improved our research reputation and rankings. And that in turn led to um, more and better and higher quality international students. And that, that trend which started in the mid nineties uh, was accelerated during 2000s and then really um, reached, I guess, its peak in, in, in 2019, which I think has been and could still be the high watermark for international students in Australian universities. But as a consequence of that very successful business model, the extent to which our research has been funded by government and other sources has, has declined. So when the pandemic hit um, and uh, the uh, uh, into, we, for, for many of us, um, it, it varied across the sector. We had um, a drop in international student revenue quite quickly, along with a whole range of other uh, challenges in dealing with, um, obviously, like all, all organisations, the impact of the pandemic, of lockdowns, of border closures, impact on the economy, economy and the stock market and, you, you know, um, 
just life in general. And that's continued into 2022, even though we thought 2022 might be a bit more optimistic. And in many ways it has, because we've, we're dealing and living with COVID and we've, we've returned to much of our normal operations, but we still have some challenges, particularly with students and uh, staff and exchanges with China as they remain um, uh, locked down and difficult to, to manage. So in um, 2019, I said, was the high watermark for Chinese, uh, for uh, international students' enrolment. And, and um, in 2019, uh, students from the uh, mainland China were um, the highest proportion of international students, especially in the G08. So the higher you ranked, the more that paradigm kicked in. Um, uh, as we've um, returned to um, campus and to, to on-campus learning, we've seen very good return from Indian students. Um, two years of pent-up demand there, seen um, uh, us at QUT, for example, have Indian students exceed Chinese students for the first time in many years. And um, the GO8 in particular, but QUT as well, um, those of us that had students already enrolled from China, that many of them stayed online. And that's the reason why you've seen in the last month or so, um, universities reporting strong surpluses this year, but it, and it's also the government investment, the share market our, our, and a whole range of other factors, but that held up. We had what I could now call the previous federal government kept us pretty busy over that period um, with uh, a new way of funding undergraduate students that was essentially asking us to do more with less and for students to pay more in certain disciplines. Um, a focus on trying to broaden the international student base, uh, emphasis on a whole range of security measures and foreign relations measures and a strong um, interest and um, encouragement around university research, commercialization and collaboration with industry. So um, all things that QUT didn't find particularly challenging um, with, but, um, and we were well positioned to take advantage of, except for the trying to do a bit more with less. So where are we now in, um, at the start of 2022 or in the first quarter of 2022? Most uh, Queensland universities reported um, through that combination of uh, an investment in international, edu uh, international education provider, which was realized, the government investment in research of $1 billion and uh, international students staying online for those that were already enrolled, um, have uh, this year reported, um, or that's for last year, reported um, reasonable results, not quite as spectacular as some in the Southern states, including the ones reported in New South Wales today, but, um, for the University of Queensland and to a lesser extent QUT in Griffith, um, we've seen um, international revenue hold up, not as um, in, in our case uh, and in Griffith's case, um, not to the same extent that UQ. So that has reduced our flexibility in terms of our capacity to offer, uh, to take from that revenue source and invest in research. And that was the context of which um, we moved to make some of the changes that we made in uh, 2020 and that have rolled into 2021 and I think positioned us well for 2022. So um, we've learned many lessons through this period as I'm sure all organizations have had, but one of the key things um, we found is that we really had to look at our own operating environment, our own business model and not follow what other institutions were doing and, and, and look collectively at where we were as an institution, how we responded to that and uh, not try and stand still as we were responding to that. And so uh, one of the challenges that we had um, is that uh, with the way in which that university research uh, business model had evolved, university research models had evolved in many places to establish separate research institutes and TRI is a, a, a collaborative a version of that. Um, and QUT had uh, was not as far along that path as um, other institutions. So we had established IBI, the Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation, um, in, in uh, the early uh, phases of that and the Institute for Future Environments as well. One of the things that, um, as, as I said, uh, many universities in a way to uh, building research capacity and building collaboration, such as we've done here at TRI, was to sub establish separate uh, research institutes and many universities have done that. Is there an unusual echo there that I need to deal with or is it okay? Might be just that one. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. That's a little better. Um, and so um, as, as we look to respond quickly to some of the challenges that we may have had, uh, that we did have and that we did had moving forward, we, we're not so far along uh, this journey of establishing the separate research institutes that we could, weren't in a position to wind those back. And so we did that as part of our response to the... Um, Yep. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that we did was we moved very quickly to align our teaching and research into faculties to give uh, the alignment with where we saw our, our revenue going forward, whereas previously there'd been a disconnect in the sense that us, along with all Australian universities, had essentially been taking um, revenue from uh, earned in business and to a lesser extent engineering and reinvesting that in health and uh, medical research. And so as part of our response to the challenges that we're facing, potentially um, uh, not having international students for that, both this couple of years, but also uh, maybe not at the same levels going forward, we moved to align our research and teaching into five faculties. And those faculties are about the same size so that we can provide uh, central services in a, in a more efficient way. We centralised the management of research and infra investment infrastructure and support, and that had previously been managed through the two institutes. Um, we appointed uh, DVC Research, a distinguished professor, Christopher Barnacolic, a PVC Research Infrastructure, who some of you may have encountered now, Stephen Blanksbury, who's working um, in the uh, research support and research infrastructure area. And uh, prior to the pandemic, had appointed Mark Harvey as the VP Business Development and consolidated, aid, consolidated all our business development, commercialisation and industry engagement teams. And another feature of um, as we move to appoint new, new people or move people into new roles uh, as a result of that restructure, we really focused on trying to ensure that we had leaders who themselves had very strong research or academic track records and, and that therefore we devolved, um, you know, had a much more distributed approach to uh, research leadership, as well as um, at the same time uh, establishing research centres where uh, which were of a scale that they could also be uh, managed and led by the leaders in that field and, and distinguished Professor Lynn Griffiths, who's known to you, many of you, uh, is the Centre for the Genomics, not Geonomics, and Personalised Health, and Stephen McPhail's another person you may have encountered as the Centre for health, leader of the Centre for Healthcare Transformation. And that's working very well because we've now got quite a distributed leadership of, of research opportunities, and we're seeing that in uh, new activities, new commercial activities, um, and built on some historical strengths and some new areas, uh, better performance and, and outcomes in uh, Australian Research Council. Um, we've got our, um, and our research incomes and our industry and international partnerships have continued to grow. And we're seeing um, that in, in reflecting our performance, and I'll skip through this because I'm a bit short of time, but we're, we're, we're now um, and continuing to, to maintain our position around that sort of nine, 10 mark in Australian universities in terms of research performance, which is, um, come from a very, um, you know, come a, a very long way over the last 15 years or so. And we're seeing um, that partnerships team and the industry engagement team working together with the research team, the deans and the leaders of centres, really developing a whole range of um, really exciting uh, new partnerships as well, distributed across all our, our strengths and um, just some of them there. And one of the approaches that QT's taken to developing industry partnerships. And one of the reasons why it's very successful, I think, and has been historically and continues to be, is that um, my observation when I arrived and it, that's continued and been encouraged by the current leadership is that we take our research much closer to the industry partner than typically is the case. And uh, I use this example, this is an example from chemistry, which is my home discipline, where we have a team led by Sarah Cooperthwaite working with an industry partner, uh, Lava Blue, to develop high purity alumina from clay in a way that is now both important and, and cost effective as um, high purity alumina is such an important component of battery technology and other materials going forward. And they've worked starting at the laboratory scale then we've developed a, a pilot plant 
in out at Redlands in, in collaboration with the industry partner. So we're scaling up that chemistry and working with the industry partner work much further down the pathway than we would have done traditionally. And that that's replicated with a, a range of our industry partners um, across the board where we're really, really that sort of a traditional approach of doing some interesting chemistry, publishing it, throwing out the defence to someone. We're actually working uh, hand in hand with the industry partner. We just saw a big investment into this which I believe was approved pre-caretaker from the previous government into the Lava Blue, the company, and that will feed back into the research of the team as they work with the company to scale up the chemistry in a pilot plant here in Brisbane and then ultimately to develop and deploy that technology in uh, central Queensland to extract um, that alumina from those clay soils. So that's just one example, but there are many others. So this... Some of that work and, and the, our approach had started pre the pandemic and in fact stemmed from our, our previous or our current strategy, which is called Blueprint 6, which built on historical um, strategies and, and the good work of my predecessors before that, where we focused on, um, uh, you know, the, the engagement with our community and um, you know, entrepreneurship, building sustainability, a whole range of different areas and a very strong engagement. Uh, with Indigenous Australians and health and wellbeing, obviously, which is important to all of us. So what are we doing now? Well, um, the, the uh, last budget that was delivered by the outgoing government had a strong focus and, and, and some good investments in, in industry and commercialisation. And I believe that most of those will be maintained. I'm not sure um, how, how, you know, our indicator are that those programs, those investments that were approved um, will continue, they obviously have to, um, but, and also some of the forward commitments. And so the incoming government, I suspect, will uh, still be very heavily focused on industry engagement as well. And um, my experience, because I was in Canberra in 2007 when the Labor government came in, in then, is um, that they, stick, they stuck very religiously to their election commitments. So they won't be uh, opening their doors to, to new bids tomorrow. They will work through ensuring that they can fund their current election commitments. And if you look at where they've um, indicated the Labor Party um, a platform in um, of election commitments, there's still a very strong um, emphasis on industry and commercialisation and, and creating um, links to the economy and job creation for investments, including in medical science. So if you, if you uh, read the fine print of the ALP policy, uh, medical science is, is mentioned a, along with a number of other areas um, that QUT and, and other Queensland universities are focused on. The, um, uh, they have announced 20,000 notional places. That's a, that's a dollar figure that will transfer for into um, places. And we expect um, that uh, that focus will again be aligned to um, the new places, will be aligned to both population growth, but also areas of skill and need um, for uh, the economy, as we know, um, uh, the workforce is an increasing issue. So um, where we're seeing um, demand um, is in health, obviously, and in and the health workforce, but also IT engineering and the physical sciences. And um, that there we know that there are areas of demand from industry and other employers and government and health, um, the health system as well. And so um, I suspect that everything that we do in this next little while will have to have a very strong focus on building the workforce. And there'll be less emphasis on uh, research that underpins that. So we've also looked at, um, as part of our strategy, how we can um, revamp our career curriculum, make it more relevant, and we've got a range of activities happening there. As the University for the Real World, you'd expect that, including um, moving to personalise some of our, our curriculum to take the learnings from the pandemic to ensure that we're making connections and giving students the opportunities that they need to position themselves um, as the workforce of the future. Obviously, a really exciting opportunity for all of us here in Queensland will be um, the Olympics and the impact that that will have on um, Southeast Queensland, the infrastructure around us, the transport infrastructure, the people that will bring. Um, 
what we saw in Sydney, and I was in uh, New South Wales during the uh, Sydney 2000 Olympics, is we got many unexpected benefits, even though we were terribly afraid that we would see no state government investment into universities or to research at that time. And there was a dip as uh, um, government funding was um, focused on developing the infrastructure, but there was a big bonus in terms of awareness of our, uh, we, we were, I was in Wollongong at the time, we had you know, different international teams training at, at Wollongong. There was a, a great um, many job opportunities for our students and many partnerships that came from that. So I think we don't yet know what all the benefits of the Olympics will be, but um, obviously um, where TRI is, we're right in the heart of it here and we'll see um, lots of activity uh, and, uh, and hopefully further investment in business, but in government and in that growing uh, population. So... Um, what we can control, I think, um, as we work through what opportunities there are is we've taken a very strong um, uh, uh, position at QUT to align our research and education. So we want to grow those two things together um, to consolidate research support and we need to collaborate as it's essential. It's always been important, but I think it's existential as we move in um, to an environment where there won't be as much research money uh, for, for fundamental research, I suspect. And so we will need to ensure that we support our fundamental research and uh, our partnerships with collaborations. And um, there's um, the population uh, boom that um, is um, com coming first to Southeast Queensland because of the migration to Queensland, but there's also the project, the finally the uh, Costello baby boom and that will start to hit universities in 24 and 25 and so if you um, look at the other large cities in Australia Melbourne and Sydney they're sustaining two or more um, top universities and so Brisbane and southeast Queensland is well placed I think as we see the population grow and, and experience this to sustain um, uh, at least three and maybe more um, top Australian universities and that's important because still our, our major source of funding is is, is students and domestic students in particular. Um, during 2022, we've had a strong focus on organisational culture. So um, uh, not everybody we had, all, like all of us experienced, um, it wasn't pleasant being, being uh, not being able to come to campus, not having students on campus, working from home, uh, having to deal with the anxiety of, of, of of structural changes and job losses. So, but I'm pleased that um, as students have returned to campus and, and staff have returned to campus, there's, a, there's an incredible vibe, vibe about the place and uh, we're seeing uh, lots of good energy and activity as a consequence. We didn't anticipate the floods, obviously, um, but um, that uh, set us back for a few weeks, um, but I was really pleased with the planning that had been done at QUT, which I can take no credit for, so that we were able to get up and running relatively quickly, um, despite some very significant disruption. The other thing that's in, in that focus on organisational culture, we're really focused on the impact of individuals. And so we know, and this is just one of many um, surveys or research that's saying that the impact of the pandemic on researchers, two years of research careers because they couldn't attend conferences, couldn't, um, uh, um, there were delays in publications and, and, and meeting milestones. And there's a level of anxiety around that and that we need to manage and really um, focus on supporting, particularly the early career uh, and mid-career researchers who, who feel that, that more acutely as they've been less established or fighting to become established. So we're putting a lot of thought into how we can support early career researchers and, um, and um, mid-career researchers. And Christopher, in, in his response to the organisational culture work, has um, surveyed mid early career researchers, mid-career researchers to really see how we can target uh, opportunities to them and, um, and, and, and work with where the opportunities are for them, We're not just in the traditional um, uh, competitive grant schemes, which we know are still um, incredibly competitive, but partnering them with the industry, giving them the support and the training that they need uh, to engage with industry, as we saw um, in the example of Sarah Cooperthwaite, who's a, a mid-career academic in, in the chemistry school or chemistry and physics school. We're also looking at um, questions around how a diversity and inclusion, like everybody else, and if you haven't seen it or haven't, what should I recommend um, 
don't often recommend um, Netflix um, shows to people outside the family, but um, this one, Picture a Scientist, uh, which is a really compelling story of the way um, both young scientists uh, who experienced um, challenges in field work and, and the way they were treated, but also some older scientists who um, had to tackle the space issues for women in, at MIT and how the different institutions responded to that. And it, it was wonderful actually to see um, the way that MIT and also Boston University did respond to that. Now, that could be picture a surgeon. It could be picture a uh, lawyer, a young lawyer, like anywhere where there's an power imbalance uh, and that those with the power have a, a disproportionate impact on the trainee, you get these kinds of issues. And we need to, as leaders and in our workplaces, look at how we can do more to proactively lead the change. And so that's something really, obviously, we've um, have done a lot nationally. Uh, we're working on QUT, but there's still more work to go, particularly as we saw in COVID, the questions of insecure work, those who are on research fellowships, those who are on uh, in, in uh, short-term teaching posts and how we can, which just accentuates those um, power imbalances and then further disenfranchise those that are either um, come from a different background or don't have the same social or political capital. So that's an area of um, great emphasis for us as well. And we know that um, all good research environments have um, have good and generous leaders. And, and, and these are some examples. When I did the first um, research assessment exercise at the ARC and I looked at where the the strong research environments were outside the GO8, which are more, were more comprehensive. It was physics at Macquarie, it was nursing here, it was um, chemistry at Wollongong Micro at Melbourne, uh, where they'd all been historically a good, um, good leadership. So and many psychology disciplines, David would know. And so um, I'm also looking at how we can uh, recognize and reward leadership and how we can make that a more of a criteria for um, our, our institutional leaders that, um, where they're not naturally generous, that we actually reward them for that generosity through uh, recognising that the success of those that work with them uh, is just as important as their own individual success. And so uh, we're working um, um, through our strategic priorities to 2027 with, um, you know, we, we expect to be the, the, the same size, um, roughly um, same faculties, but with a different mix of students um, to consolidate um, facilities, but to engage with industry, government and the community much more and to put that kind of support for that engagement um, into our um, uh, research and, 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 and our, um, uh, our staff going forward. We're not trying to be comprehensive. We're, we're very much, we're very comfortable with our identity as a, as a technologically technical university with a, with some um, important areas such as social sciences, law and business uh, to underpin that strength. And we're very conscious that um, collaboration is the key to our future. So if you do a diagram where you look at our most, um, this just shows you who we publish with the most from QUT, uh, surprise, surprise, it's UQ and Griffith. If you do the same for Melbourne and Monash or you do the same for MIT and Harvard or NUS and NTU, UNSW and Sydney, the pattern's slightly different, but basically, you know, collaboration is key to that. And so um, those working in, in places such as TRI, well positioned uh, and very comfortable that our QUT folk are, are um, uh, working within that collaboration. So we're developing a new strategy going forward in, uh, uh, and uh, it's focused very much on making those connections, aligning everything that we do so that we, uh, have um, a good um, strategic alignment as well as um, opportunities for individuals within that in a range of areas, many of which have carried through from previous uh, strategies, but we're um, looking to um, uh, strengthen our activities in health and wellbeing, both for our staff, but also for our students and that opportunity with a big growth area there, and then build on uh, some of the work that we've done in, in the previous strategies around sustainability and environment. We're the first university to appoint a, C, a PVC uh, focused on that. We've done a lot of good groundwork in the last couple of years around our engagement with Indigenous communities. Inclusion and social justice has been a strong um, component of QUT's um, 
ethos and uh, really looking to empower the next generation of leaders um, through um, having research active leaders uh, appointed and also uh, bringing through that next generation with a strong focus on their development. So I don't think I actually answered the question, but alternative funding sources um, it is going to require um, alignment with the priorities of the state and the federal government. And I thought that prior to the election, and I think that will continue. It will take time to build and rebuild a case for further basic research investment. It has, um, as a proportion of our total research investment has um, dropped off in recent years, there won't be any uh, magic bullets. I think Building sovereign research capabilities is something, and sovereign capabilities more generally, is that all levels of government have um, recognised uh, post the pandemic. And we will see, I think, collaborative um, investment in uh, focused areas that are seen as um, uh, key to the future. And, and medtechs in that, uh, we're seeing a lot of activity in clean energy and making um, in, in agriculture and biotechnology. And I think uh, Brisbane, as it grows in the next 10 years, uh, will provide um, many opportunities to leverage those strengths of our collection, collective institutions. So, um, Scott, I'll stop there. And uh, I think I've managed to get through that, despite my lateness and the technical hitches, um, with enough time for questions. So thank you. Thanks very much, Margaret. And for those people who are wondering, um, one of the issues was uh, that the people online were not necessarily good at getting good contact uh, with the talk. So um, that was really fascinating to see your insights as we start to come out of the pandemic and look towards the future, including 2032. Um, I'd just like to tease you out a little bit on the connections with industry. I mean, most academic researchers have been schooled in the concept of the metrics that our bosses will measure is our grant success, our student completions, and our publication impact or the classic metrics. How is the university starting to think about the support that it will give to acknowledge that there are other uh, ways of um, acknowledging different pathways than the classic metrics that we all know so well? Um, so, Scott, that's a really good question. So one of the things we've done um, uh, in our promotion framework, but also in our recognition um, and reward structures more broadly, is look to, um, uh, to imbue a philosophy that actually we don't care which mountain you climb, um, whether it's um, a sort of traditional um, competitive grant mountain or an industry um, engaged and supported mountain. We just want you to be really good at whatever you do. And we want to, um, uh, and we recognize that through our academic career framework that recognizes different careers uh, and different ways in which people are able to build careers. I think we still do pretty well for, and we're continuing to evolve that, but doing pretty well now for the leads in that. So if I take, um, uh, you know, Sarah as an example of um, such the, uh, person I showed who was collaborating with Lava Blue. We're doing, we still struggle a little bit with the collaborators, you know, so the people that really make it happen, whether they're running facilities or, um, uh, uh, you know, this, you know, it doesn't matter how many times I say it, you know, then you'll, you'll read a referee's report or someone will comment, oh, but they're not CIA on the grant, you know. And so um, recognizing that, that teams and collaboration. Um, and those skills are not always the same. And, um, and then looking to have um, uh, promote that success through, um, uh, th through, you know, again, our rewards and recognition. And just look, quite frankly, uh, you know, it's it, the effort that has gone into, say, developing that partnership with Lava Blue versus the effort in writing a, a, a competitive research grants is probably greater. Um, and so um, it's really ensuring that we we want and but we we know that um industry engagement and industry partners also want to have really good engagement with great fundamental research as well so it's getting a kind of balance and a spectrum of, of that and we have um i think um gone a long ways at qt and i i did um 
maybe it didn't get quite as far with that at Melbourne, but I got a long way there too for that institution. Thank you. For those people online, you can type in your questions. Um, Graham. <clears throat> Thanks, Margaret. I think there's Health Translation Queensland has recently come out with a paper in the health and medical space about the underrepresentation of Queensland in terms of national granting, especially um, NHMRC and MRFF. A lot of that is around how do we better engage with our clinical colleagues in the hospitals. Uh, do you have a view of how the universities uh, can more better uh, build that interaction so that we can be more competitive in that space? Um, yeah, and I mean, I think um, there's two dimensions to that. There's the um, NHMRC, which has got, um, uh, you know, the, there's the, the, the um, you know, historical numbers of researchers we've had and, and, and their priorities and whether we align with those. And then there's the MRFF, which has had a slightly more political overlay um, with the Health Minister for Victoria. Um, and so I think we'll see some rebalancing of that. I suspect there'll be some reviews also around, you know, how some of those decisions are made in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, collaborations and, and, you know, versus, you um, uh, other considerations, um, if, if that's code. Um, but I think, uh, you know, that's why every talk I give in Queensland, I talk about collaboration because um, even with, um, uh, and I think the universities have moved a long way uh, in that in, and, 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 you know, I think we're collaborating pretty well, but I think we've still got challenges with north and south of the river with people wanting to lead things and, um, um, uh, and also this, some of the issues we have with the scale of the health system, you know, the health services here are very large. And um, uh, so in some other parts of the world, when I, other parts of the country, there's, it's been easy to put some of those things together in small, with smaller, um, smaller partnerships on the, on the health side as well. And so it's not, there's no simple fix other than continuing to, um, we're seeing also really good um, talent attraction to Queensland. I think, you know, that, that we're both returning Queenslanders in, in, in roles that we're advertising, but also a sense that there's, that there's an energy about the place that we're also seeing good talent to fix, uh, to fill some of the gaps that we might have clinically or, or scientifically. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, that was a, a, a great talk. Now, one of the great achievements of the Peter Beatty Smart State was of course the Ibby Kelvin Grove campus. And since those heady days, I think a lot of the investment has really tailed off. How would you see QT positioning itself with the state government to try and go back to the Smart State? Um, so, I mean, they were heady days and they were a unique, um, period in Queensland's history, I think. I, you know, I, it seems like wherever I move, the state government lose interest in what I'm doing. So when I was in New South Wales, we had no engagement with the state government and I'd go to bio and meet Peter Beattie and think, wow, and then I leave Victoria and they've made a massive investment into research in Victoria. So um, I, don't, I don't see um, that um, we, and, you know, the, the in IBI was started with the combination of the philanthropy and the state government, and it's still very much um, a core part of our, um, you know, the facility and, and the research is encompassed in there in those centres rather than the institute per se. Um, we, um, uh, so I'm not sure we're all the positioning will be in the biotech biomedical space. I think, you know, what, I, what we're hearing from the state government is interest in um, in other areas, such as you know, um, obviously um, uh, green energy and, and 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 agriculture, and so I guess the question for um, as we position the um, you know our collective health and medical research efforts is also about the link to the workforce and the link to jobs and what that can mean uh, in terms of creating jobs, um, and I think that's where 
all levels. They're so focused. I mean, you know, 3% unemployment everywhere they go, people are talking about not having workforce. And so anything that talks about creating, um, uh, attracting people who will then both create jobs but also create um, um, I, I, it's sort of funny to be talking about creating jobs when we've got such low unemployment. But when, um, as immigration returns and international students return, that'll that'll um, some of that will uh, um, peter, peter off. So it's it's really linking to the future of Queensland, and I think um, um, and the needs of the health force and the needs of uh, Queensland going forward, I think more so than building a kind of pharmaceutical industry, which I don't think will um, fly, except in niche areas, you know, but it's not going to be the, have the same impact as um, energy and agriculture. Margaret, um, you talked in one of your slides about the previous federal government, and my question was going to be, uh, what's next for the university sector, but you sort of answered that by talking about that you thought this government was going to um, keep this aircraft carrier going in the same direction with what it's announced. And you talked about sovereign manufacturing and industry engagement. What are the approaches that the university is taking at all levels, particularly for the earlier career researchers to understand what that career pathway looks like and some of those practical things. You talked about the Redlands opportunity, but what about our EMCRs based uh, in health and medical research? Um, uh, thanks, Scott. And yeah, I, so I think one of the things that we need to look at is um, uh, how we can better integrate the careers of our early, early and mid-career researchers in medical research into our uh, teaching and, and other programs going forward. So. Um, the um, capacity to sustain a research-only workforce in health and medical research without um, a massive a further investment into, into um, um, either the NHMRC or, or they never get massive investments into the ARC. So I think it's working um, with them to look at um, uh, how we can also make sure that we've got the right kind of, um, you know, skills and expertise within our institutions and that we can encourage people to move in and out of some of that, you know, so maybe um, uh, fill a, 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 you know, run a course for a period or something that would also build um, their own skills. It was interesting, the, um, the chief defence scientist and CSIRO is doing something similar. They run a call for... Um, uh, just a sort of, uh, you know, collective talent call and um, uh, for uh, researchers in, in a whole, you know, they didn't specify the disciplines per se and they did say that they got an incredible, which didn't surprise me at all, that they got a, a number of biomedical and, and, and um, 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 a biomedical and, base, and, and basic scientists as well, but there was a disproportionate number of biomedical scientists represented in that. And so... Um, and it's also about um, the question around the MRFF and what the government will do going forward and how we can bring some of that investment to Queensland to provide those sort of opportunities and also recognising different kinds of careers. So it's, there's no simple answer to that, Scott. Yeah. And I think there's a question online. Enjoyed the talk. We have found the UQQUT collaboration has been vital for our future leaders at UQ. What do you see as the best grant opportunities for such teams? Um, quite sure. Um, well, I think I think the more um, that I mean, it's very hard to create top-down opportunities for researchers. They've got to want to work together and identify the problems. And so, um, what I think we've got to do as a institutional leaders is not put any barriers into that. So we say we're, we're the best outcome for the team, regardless of who leads it or um, is, is really um, what we're trying to do. And so in terms of opportunities, I think um, focusing on um, big questions um, uh, and um, really working out um, 
you know, using teams to to come together to address something that you wouldn't otherwise uh, be able to do, and whether that's within an institution or across the institution, it shouldn't matter. Yeah. Are there any other questions? If not, I think it's um, our opportunity to thank Margaret for giving us a great insight into the current challenges and the future opportunities in the university sector. Um, and <clears throat> it's a privilege to have you as one of our shareholders of TRI here today. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you.